So um, I'm going to tell you about our story about creating um, exceptional and forward-thinking uh, products with new technologies. So when I started to do this in 2007, electric cars were not considered sexy or fast or exclusive or anything like this. People would rather think about something like this. Oops. <laughs> yeah. People would rather think about something like this uh, if you mention an electric car. So not really something useful or beautiful or fast or anything like that. And if, we, if I ask you if you know any creation product or creation high technology product, would you know of any if we don't consider the startup world at the moment? So um, I, I mostly get the answer that nobody has ever heard of any creation product, not, uh, not to mention a high technology product. Maybe this, the Yugo, <laughs> which was produced in our um, old uh, non-existing country um, of Yugoslavia. So this was not even produced in Croatia, but in today's, uh, nowadays Serbia. So the odds of making something innovative and sexy uh, by combining this and that were not really good, weren't they? So um, we still decided to, to do it, to develop a car that's not only beautiful, but technologically advanced. To go from scratch and design first the technology and then the car. It was a long journey. I started uh, in 2006 um, with my first patent innovation when I was 17 years old, a computer glove. My professor uh, at that time uh, in uh, high school sent me to national competitions where I won the first place. Then they sent me all over the world and I came back with gold awards from um, Kuala Lumpur, Geneva, and things like that. And I made my first money and bought myself um, this very old BMW, which is four years older than I am, because I loved cars, I loved racing. Um, and I started to race it with a gas engine, which blew up soon after that. And this was a good trigger for me to combine my two passions, electronics and cars. So I didn't just want to replace the gas engine with, with another gas engine. I uh, wanted to... Uh, use the potential that the electric motor has. I thought that the electric motor can be used to make a great sports car. So I started to work in my garage. My goal was to make an electric race car. And I started to compete against gas-powered race cars soon after that. Um, when I went to the first race, everybody was making, you know, millions of jokes. Um, can I charge my phone on your car? Uh, what are you doing with this washing machine on the racetrack? Uh, get the hell out of here. <laughs> you know, I was there with this old green BMW uh, next to fire spitting, turbo, nitro, you know, uh, V8 engined uh, uh, drag cars and tried to race them. And of course, at the first race, everything, you know, fall apart. The differential broke, too much torque. And after each race, I came back to my garage and made the car better, improved it, made it more efficient, made it lighter, more powerful. The components that I initially bought, I replaced with things I developed by myself. And the car got better and better. And after some time, I started winning. That was the first time in history that an electric car, in the same regulations as gas-powered cars, won. So the electric car was faster than gas-powered cars uh, on the racetrack, with no special regulations. We were in the same categories. Uh, in 2000 and then I won the first time. Uh, I, there were 300 cars on the track, and this car was the fastest. So the people that were laughing at the beginning, uh, they came later to the race just to see this car because it was so different. It was so interesting to see this silent old BMW win against a 1,000 horsepower screaming dragster. Soon after that, I broke five FIA and Guinness World Records for the fastest accelerated electric car. Those records I still hold. And then I decided to make a car from scratch. Why would I develop all this technology and put it in an old BMW? Uh, why this picture? Because the car industry is dominated by huge conglomerates, uh, which are five decades old or older. Some of them, or most of them really, are older than a century. Um, they, are, they have armies of engineers and billions of development budgets. And then came I, you know, a guy from uh, Croatia, uh, 
I was maybe 20 years old at that time, uh, alone in my garage, who wants to build the world's fastest electric car. Um, two years later, we presented the uh, Concept One at the Frankfurt Motor Show. And so between the decision and to this delivered car was a huge, huge journey and a lot of headache and, um, you know, blood, sweat and tears, like always. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just too much to squeeze it into a presentation. So let's just, just believe me that it was really, really hard. <laughs> um, the reason why, we, why I've done this is this guy over there, uh, some might recognize him, is Nikola Tesla. He was born just 100 miles from here, from this very spot where we are standing. Um, so he was always an inspiration for me. And the thing he has in front of him is the alternating current electric motor, induction motor. So I believe that this machine is just so much better to power really anything. So not just sports cars, but many, many different applications. So I decided to build the car around that to showcase that potential, to use the potential to the maximum. This is our latest powertrain generation. So we have, in one common housing, we have two uh, motors, which are completely independent with each one uh, with its own uh, gearbox. So what we are doing, we have one of these systems in the front and one in the rear of the car. So we are controlling each wheel independently 100 times per second. So that's just one of the advantages, advantages that we have with this powertrain layout. Um, some of you know that the electric motor has uh, incredible torque at zero speed. So as soon as you step on the throttle, the power is always there. The torque is immediately there. You don't need a clutch to start. You don't need a gearbox. So these are just two of the advantages that we have with the electric motor. There are really no downsides. The downside at the moment is still at the battery, but the motor cannot get any better. Our production car motor, so the Concept One is really a production car. Believe it or not, we are just making uh, customer cars. You guys that have visited the company yesterday have probably seen uh, them in production. So in a production car, we have a motor that has 5.7 kilowatts per kilogram of power, 5.7. A Formula One engine in 2014 had 2.5 kilowatts of power per kilo kilogram. Uh, combustion engine cars, sports cars, cannot come even close to Formula One engines when it comes to power density. We suppress them by double, twice as much power per kilogram in a road car. Of course, this advantage is soon um, taken away by the weight of the batteries. So there is a lot of room to improve the batteries, but the motors cannot get much better because they are already today, they have incredible power density. They have incredible reliability. They, will, they can work for 100 years without changing any major parts and they have 95 and more percent efficiency. So what we do with this kind of powertrain setup is you can see here uh, a simulation. Uh, we are sending torque commands to each wheel 100 times per second. So here um, we have demonstrated the safety feature of our torque vectoring system. So uh, it's not just to increase performance, but actually to, to, make, it, um, to make the car safer. Uh, so we are developing this torque vectoring system to use the maximum potential of the architecture of the car that we have, and we develop all of this in-house. Uh, the torque vectoring system consists of many subsystems. Uh, so the guys that develop it do millions of simulations. You know, we, we size the car and all the systems to, to take full advantage of it. And you can see here how, how it distributes the power. Um, so what can happen for a moment is that Two wheels accelerate and two brake. But the two wheels braking are not using the brakes. They are actually using the electric motors to generate the energy and put it back into the motor. Uh, any, tradition, any modern car today has an um, ESP system, which keeps the car on track, traction control. Uh, but this system can only brake wheels and take away power from the engine. And it's using hydraulic brakes, which are very slow and inefficient. Um, so this system is very different. Uh, in one system, which is controlled by software, uh, we have electric ABS, traction control, and stability control. So one system is doing all the work through software and through controlling the motors. 
So when we brake, we use the all, all four motors of the car, and we brake 99% of the time just with the electric motors and get as much energy back into the batteries as we can. And since we have independent control of each wheel, we can also do independent ABS of each wheel. So this is a complete, completely new system, a drive-by-wire system, truly, uh, compared to traditional cars. So my idea was never to make just an electric sports car. My idea was always to improve the sports car, to make it better, to make the sports car of the 21st century. And we think that the electric sports car with a configuration like this can be much better in every regard compared to, to uh, traditional sports cars. So uh, this is uh, how it looked in theory. Here we can see it in practice. <laughs> So on the left side you have throttle position, power on each wheel, steering pedal position, uh, steering wheel position, and you can see how the power shifts really quickly between the wheels to keep the car on track and do exactly what the driver wants. So when we brake, the energy goes back into the batteries. When you go through the corner, the car sends different power to each wheel to keep it on track. So the system does all of this without the driver really knowing what's going on. The driver just puts, you know, the, turns the steering wheel around, hits the throttle, and the car goes exactly where you want, the way you want it. We have different settings. So for less experienced drivers, you can choose the understeer setup, and the car is really safe, and anybody can drive the 1,000 horsepower car. But if you are an experienced driver and like to slide around, there is a different mode of the system. Uh, which is called oversteer, which allows you to slide and the car helps you to slide and keep it in the sliding position in the oversteer. So with just a touch of a button, you can have a completely different car, which is impossible to do with a traditional car. So you can, with this kind of powertrain, you can have a very personalized car for the very um, application, for, for the very moment you want. If you are driving on a normal road or on a racetrack, the car can complete, completely differently behave, which is a big advantage. So here, for example, we can see a situation where our system saved the, uh, the corner, which wouldn't be really possible with, with a traditional system. So you can do extreme things, and the system will do everything it takes to keep the car on track. Our, our goal is always to increase performance. So uh, here we can see a comparison between our third generation and fourth generation powertrain system. With each generation, we lower the weight, increase power, increase efficiency. So we have gone 45% uh, down in, in weight and increased power 23% from the third generation to the fourth generation. We do this with the battery packs, with everything we do. So here we can see something that I consider um, like, you know, battle of f future and past electrons and fuel. So uh, the Concept 1 has 800 kilos of battery. The Ferrari over there has 75 liters of gas. So let's say 80 kilos of gas. Uh, those 80 kilos of gas hold 750 kilowatt hours while the Concept 1 batteries hold only 90. So, uh, with so much energy difference, so more, uh, let's say 10 times energy difference, we still have, both cars have approximately the same range. How is that possible? It's possible because uh, the electric motor is so efficient. The batteries are really, really bad, believe me. They are really bad compared to gas. They are crap. And still we manage to get a decent range out of the cars because we have the motors which are so good. So the batteries have a huge um, potential to be better. And by coming close to gas, just being, you know, even being 70% worse, the, the electric car will just, you know, take over and there will be no comparison. But now the batteries are 90% worse than gas in storing energy. So, um, it's, we are just on the limit of making cars, electric cars valuable, of making them with enough range and with enough uh, recharge speed and everything else to, to make them um, usable for a part of the population. But to reach 100% of population, or let's say 60% of population, if we are honest, the batteries have to be three to four times better than they are today. 
But uh, what I'm happy about is that we are there already today with all the other systems, just the batteries need to improve. So uh, coming back to our company, uh, just a brief history. So um, we have, I've have started to make this car in 2008, the, the green car. Uh, my first employees joined end of 2011. Um, in, 2000, um, in September 2011, we have, uh, sorry, first employees joined 2010. In 2011, we presented the concept one. We had our first profitable year in 2012. And since then, we have been profitable every year. And as far as I know, we are the only profitable electric car company in the world. Uh, so we have been uh, developing technologies for other companies, and that has keeping us, uh, that has kept us afloat. So we basically bootstrapped uh, electric car company, and we had our first investment round last year. So we had an organic growth before of that uh, bank loan. So now we do two uh, different businesses. We make our own sports cars. Uh, so the concept one, obviously, and we are developing new models. But on the other hand, we offer solutions and technologies for other companies. So the technologies that we develop for ourselves, we apply for many, many different applications. And at our core, we are first a technology company, then a car company. Uh, I was fortunate enough that I couldn't afford other people to develop things for us. So we had to start develop our own stuff. Uh, Six years ago, I would never have imagined that we will do our own infotainment system, our own suspension design, our own chassis, our own body parts, all the carbon fiber. But we were forced to because when I was knocking on the door of a car supplier, for a small bit of a car, which is maybe 2% of the car, they wanted millions because that's the way the car industry works. So I quickly realized that that's not the way I'm, I can do I can make a car. So we had to be innovative. We, have to, we had to be, you know, just try it, build it, fail, build it again, make it better. And then we had something we could sell to other people. And that's the only reason why our company survived, because we had things we could sell to other people. So the concept one is the first electric hypercar with more than 1,088 horsepower. Uh, we uh, are positioned at the moment in the full electric range. So we make full electric vehicles in the hypercar and supercar segment. And in the future, we plan to also go into extended range electric vehicles, so with range extenders. But we do not plan to go um, into a mass market. For now, we are still staying in the exclusive supercar and hypercar segment. Um, we are not, uh, it's not possible for a small company to compete in large volume, lower priced segments. It just takes billions and billions of dollars and hundreds of, or probably thousands of engineers to, to make that happen. We are happy with staying in our niche and being the best in our niche. But at the same time, developing te technologies that can be applied in many other fields. So the concept one has 2.8 seconds to 100 kilometers per hour, uh, 1,600 newton meters, 1,088 horsepower, 325 kilometers per hour top speed with the four motor configuration that I've mentioned before. And all of the technologies, everything you see here is designed and manufactured just 20 miles from here in Sveta Nedina. So along the way of creating the Concept1, we have developed many technologies like our proprietary battery packs, battery management systems, powertrain units, and many, many different components ranging from infotainment systems to um, regenerative braking systems. The torque vectoring is one of our main, um, most innovative features, and uh, uh, we have a team dedicated just to do that, and we are now developing this uh, system for various applications, not just for sports cars. So, uh, as I said, the car industry is working in a specific way. So, for example, Ford invests $6 billion to develop a new model, $6 billion with a B. BMW invested uh, 3 billion euros into the development of the i-series, the i3 and i8. Fisker, a startup company, blew $1.4 billion on developing of the Karma. Uh, and when they went bankrupt, they still had $1 billion in debt. Why? Because they hired people from Detroit to develop the car. And they did it the way they were used to at GM, Chrysler, uh, and the big companies. That's not the way you can develop uh, an innovative car, first of all, because if you are working the way everybody else is working and using the same suppliers like everybody else is using, you cannot innovate. So even Tesla, when they built the Roadster, which, is, which was based on Lotus Elise, and the technology was based on AC propulsion. So 
they had the car, they had the technology, and they spent $100 million until they had the first Roadster prototype. We did all of that with a tiny fraction of the funds they had available. In Croatia, there is no venture capital fund. We had no government support. We were working with basically nothing. The only way we could do all of this was because we did it ourselves. We tried, we didn't know how to develop a door. We didn't know how to develop a suspension. We had to learn it ourselves because there is no car industry in Croatia. So it was really hard to, for us to do that. And it took us a long time. But now we have a 100 people strong team that's one of the best teams in the world. And many big companies come to us, many. Uh, all of the car, a lot of the car industry was at our facilities and we are working on many projects now. And I'm so proud of that fact because uh, most of the people that work in our company have sit in these chairs or across the street in the um, University of Mechanical Engineering and um, have not learned the things that they need to work in the car industry. And we built up a company from the garage with people with no experience in a country with no car industry to have one of the best teams in the world of doing high performance electric cars. And now we do this kind of things for many companies that are much, much bigger and stronger than we are. So our plans in terms of uh, sports cars is to introduce new models which will be higher volume. So we plan to produce about 800 cars in 220. So it's still a fairly low volume, but for us it's huge because this year we are going to produce only five cars. So we plan to increase a lot. So now we are about 100 people. At this moment we will be probably uh, close to 2,000 people. So we plan to grow a lot, but uh, I think it's realistic. And we don't plan to be Volkswagen or Toyota. We plan to be something more like Ferrari, McLaren, Lamborghini in that regard. But we have this other niche of our business where we apply our technology to many, many different applications. So these are all real applications where we already use our technology. So uh, remember, sports cars have been considered as toys for rich guys. But this toy for rich guy for rich guys has uh, come up with technologies that have improved the life of a guy in a wheelchair. We have improved the battery of a wheelchair, not 10%, not 20. We improved it 10,000%. It has 10 times more lifetime. So instead of lasting one year, it lasts 10 years without losing any capacity. Now they have to replace the battery every year. And instead of having 10 kilometers of range, he has now 80 kilometers of range. So it's a huge improvement that supercar technology brought to a, a completely different industry. We are um, making powertrains for the naval industry and battery packs. We are developing complete mass market EVs for other companies. So we are doing the development, making prototypes and help them with the production. So a car that we are now developing will be produced in 15,000 units in the first year of production. We are working on autonomous vehicles. We are making race cars for other companies. We have just in Geneva unveiled the Koenigsegg Regera, uh, Regera hypercar. We are making electric bikes and of course our own electric hypercars. So we offer this kind of services to other companies, uh, full development. So it, it's really a broad range. Sometimes you know, individuals come to us, they want to build a car company. Can you do this for us? So we can offer the full solution. You have an idea, you have the funding, you come to us. From the first sketch on the paper to the finished prototype, we do the whole job and help you to set up the production. Or large companies come to us and ask for a small bit, let's say a spoiler system or infotainment system. We do this kind of things as well for, for various companies. So um, this is an example in Geneva in 2014, we have presented the Chorus electric bike for the Chinese company Chorus. Uh, in Geneva 2015 this year, we have presented the Koenigsegg Regera, the world's most powerful production car. For that, we have done the hybrid powertrain system. So the world's most energy dense battery pack out of such a small pack, we get 700 horsepower for this car. And, and this is a nice story actually. Christian Koenigsegg was my big hero when I started to do this. You know, I was reading everything, every bit of information I could get about him. And now, you know, we work together, we, we have lunch and dinner, he comes to Zagreb, I fly to Sweden, um, and we make parts for his car here in Croatia, ranging from batteries to subframe, and there are many, many parts in this car that are made just here. 
which is, um, I'm very proud of that because I was always looking up for him. He was one of my heroes like Nikola Tesla, but he's fortunately still alive. <laughs> so yeah, this is also a project we have done, full car for another company. And these are some of our customers. So from Siemens, Koenigsegg, Ediada, so large automotive companies as well. And our focus, as you probably have already noticed, is in-house R&D and manufacturing, vertical integration. We are capable within our fans to build a whole car. We just take raw material in terms of uh, blocks of aluminum, steel, copper, and carbon fiber, and out comes the car, really. Uh, we, I, I don't know of any more vertically integrated car company. Uh, it has not started by choice to, be, to do this that way, but we had no other way of making a car because the suppliers either didn't want to work with us because I was just a 20-year-old guy in a garage or we didn't have the money to pay them. So you were forced to do it, but now we do it by choice because it has proven to be the best way when the whole team of designing the parts and produ producing the parts and developing them is in one building. So uh, we do everything from, from the chassis to composites to the torque vectoring development, infotainment software, PCB design, milling of all this, these buttons and uh, painting the car. We do everything there. So with that technology, we have also developed a, a separated brand. We are making high-performance electric bicycles, which are, in our opinion, the most advanced electric bicycles on the planet at the moment, and they are already in in mass production, mass for our terms, we want to make 200 bikes this year. That's massive for us, but not really big um, for, for big companies. And yeah, we, we are doing this also for other companies like Koenigsegg and Chorus. Uh, and this is all part of a much bigger, bigger and broader problem. We are faced with uh, big, you know, big traffic issues in the world, especially in mega cities. We are doing silly things like this. We built buildings to store our cars. I was late here because I was driving around 20 minutes to find a parking space in Zagreb. Now imagine this in Beijing or Hong Kong or, I don't know, LA. <laughs> um, so uh, you are using your car today like 3% of the time, maybe 5%. So it's sitting around doing nothing 95% of the time. And still you need to pay parking, insurance, whatever. And you take care more of your car than you do of yourself. I don't know, I have taken my car to service in the last year probably several times, and I don't remember when I have been to the doctor in the last five years. So there are about one billion of these steel boxes uh, on the planet. So remember what I'm going to say about this. I, I, I'm, thinking, um, I'm thinking with sense, not with my heart. I love cars. I love sports cars. I, Love to drive a Ferrari, I love to drive our electric sports car, I love to be on a racetrack, I have been a racer. But let's think with our um, sense, not, not, with, you know, not with enjoying driving a car. So that's about 150 cars per 1,000 people. And in the US they are pretty uh, yeah, far off with cars, they have 770 cars per 1,000 people. In Europe we are more modest with 473 cars per 1,000 people. In China, it grew 10, 20 times from 2000 to 2010, and still, they are only at 58 cars per 1,000 people. So, 10 times less than Europe. To reach Europe or US, China has to produce a massive amount of cars that have nowhere to go. You cannot build this many roads in a few years. And just the amount of copper, steel, aluminum, and energy, and water it will take to make those cars is ridiculous. And why would you make them when they are sitting around 90% of the time anyways? So in terms of powertrain, is it going to be electric or gasoline powered? I think the answer is obvious and clear to everybody in the industry. It's going to be electric. It's just a matter of time. It's just so much more efficient and makes more sense. But it will take time, more than you probably expect. I would say five decades to have a significant market share. Uh, today, by the way, the electric cars and plug-in hybrids have less than 1% market share. So uh, why we are helping other companies, even our competitors, to come to the market? Because it's such a huge market that we take only 1% of. We are very happy for other companies to reach um, the market 
And to compete even in the same field with us, we don't care. We will be happy that our competitors use our technology maybe in a better way than we do, just to get the word out. So what's the, the bigger thing, I think? So let's forget about electrification. It's just one part. It's the most obvious part, but just a small part of, of the potential that's there. So cars are getting smarter now. They are getting aware of their environment. The next step is to start talking with each other, not just the cars between themselves, but also with the infrastructure, with the roads, with the um, municipalities. So when a car in front hits a bump, or there is, I don't know, oil leak somewhere or whatever, the cars in the rear will be informed about that. And the next step is self-driving cars. Companies like Google or some other IT companies are already working on that. Um, so uh, we, uh, we are also involved in, in some of the projects, um, not, not with this, but with some others. And I think uh, by combining uh, new models of mobility with autonomous vehicles will bring the biggest change in the way um, humans move in the past 100 years. And it will be probably a change as big as the mobile internet in the last two decades. Just imagine when all of us, when the cars, instead of being used 5% of the time, are being used 50 or 60% of the time. When, uh, how the uh, roads will be used better with autonomous vehicles that are much smarter and more aware of the um, surroundings than we are as humans and can process much more than we can. They can have many more eyes than we do. They will never be tired, never be drunk, never be distracted. So just the uh, influence it will have with less people injured, maybe no people killed on roads. So is that is our passion for cars, you know, having our own car, enjoying our own car, worth the lives that are being wasted every year because of, I don't know, of the inability of humans to, to uh, be perfect drivers. I think that the autonomous car can be a perfect driver, use the roads much better. So oh, I have read um, articles where, um, re researchers where uh, they say that autonomous vehicles will use um, roads three times better than uh, people. So uh, you don't, you just the impact it will have on road building, you will have much less energy invested in building roads, making cars, and it will be much more smart and in efficient, and it will change the world much more than the electric vehicle will do. Even if the autonomous car that I imagine will be gas powered, it will have a much greater impact on the world than all of our cars being electric, in my opinion. So we are working in that direction as well. We are, we are very aware of the fact that our sports cars are not going to change the world. They are going to change the perception about electric cars in people's minds because they can be fast and sexy and look good and be even faster than, I don't know, Lamborghini. Uh, but the bigger impact will be something like this, and we want our piece of technology to be in, in projects like that. So just to sum it up, there are three major um, areas in the car industry that are going on at the moment. It's hybridization, making existing cars hybrid, full electric vehicles, and new mobility concepts. Uh, in my opinion, the companies that do not understand that they will not be a pro that they will not be manufacturers and providers of cars in the future, but rather uh, a part of the new mobility movement, those companies will go under. Companies will not sell cars anymore; they will sell mobility. Uh, the good thing about this uh, is that it opens the door for new startups, for new companies with new ideas. The car industry has been used in universities as the perfect example of uh, entry bound, uh, of high entry boundaries to, to enter the, the industry. It's impossible to enter the car industry more or less um, until now because this is something new for everybody. Uh, the you know Uber didn't came out of uh, the car industry, so there is a chance for for new companies to to be part of the new movement or to create the new movement of mobility. Uh, so even for companies like us where we can make cars that are different with no previous background and supply technology and know-how to, to other companies uh, because it's new for, for the big companies, it's new for us and we can bring in new fresh ideas. 
we are doing our part. Um, we have, uh, we are very diversified. Some would say we need to focus more, uh, but uh, I think it's the right way to go from supercars to wheelchairs. Um, and I hope that we will um, change the industry a little bit with our little contribution and help the world become smarter and cleaner and better. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, you know what, what we always do? Can you guys hear me? What we always do is we have space for one good question. When someone thinks they can ask a really, really good question. <laughs> yes, sir, over here. Yeah, grab the mic. Hello, Matt, and thank you for a great lecture. Uh, one question. Uh, Toyota just announced uh, with his model uh, Mirai uh, hybrid revolution, uh, the um, hydrogen revolution. What do you think about it? Um, there will be many transition uh, solutions in the, in the next decade or two decades. Uh, hybrids, plug-ins, um, range extended vehicles, uh, hydrogen vehicles, which are electric cars with uh, onboard generator. Um, there will be electric cars with hybrid range with hydrogen range extenders. There will be hydrogen burning internal combustion engine cars. There will be um, fuel made out of algae or out of biomass or artificially created uh, fuel. Um, but the end solution is electric because it's just efficient. So you have a power plant which is efficient, or you have um, I don't know, uh, um, wind farms um, or solar panels, whatever. And uh, the, the best way to get that energy where it's generated into transportation is just electric. Uh, hydrogen cars are nothing more than electric cars with a different storage system instead of batteries, which are now maybe comparable to batteries, but as batteries improve the other forms of transportation will have less and less sense. So I think even today, hydrogen makes really no sense. It's just an engineering exercise. And as the batteries advance, the solution will be clearer and clearer. So I think that there is no way, uh, there is no sense for any other form of energy storage inside the car, except, I don't know, if you, if you manage to, uh, to shrink down a cold fusion that it can fit into a car. But uh, otherwise, uh, battery electric vehicles are the only sensible choice. Cool. Thank you very much, Matt. Once again, a big hand for Matt Rimas, please.